The host didn't fight out themselves. It had been Sherry's sister's daughter's 11-year-old, Martin, who had heard something behind the door and ran into the living room crying of a monster. Little did the child know, it was much worse. Carl and Sherry ran to the site, fearing the worst, and saw nothing of note right away. Both of them had assumed any problem that would have arisen would have been Maya-related, so their eyes both fixated on his closed door. They looked at each other to will the other one to try the knob, knowing full well whatever was beyond that door was a sobering reminder of nearly 50 years of cultivating the poorest parenting discipline imaginable. Carl went ahead and swallowed a big dose of O2 and stepped towards the door, pausing for the briefest of moments before he confirmed via tactile resistance that the door was indeed locked. A powerful sigh then precluded a knock and a call to the only person who could be in there. Maya responded immediately, although in a dampened tone. Carl simply asked what he was doing, then why the door was locked. Maya slowed his response rate with these questions and relayed a simple fact that he was just sitting down, nothing more. Now, Carl was perfectly content in taking his time working this out with his son, so much so that he even motioned to his wife to go back to the party. He rested his cheek against the slick eggshell paint of the door and surgically approached the goal of getting his son's overgrown ass the hell out of his old barren room by telling Maya that the deviled eggs were running low and Auntie Catherine was asking for him to help her log into the Wi-Fi. Right as he felt he was getting somewhere, Maya asked if she had finally upgraded to an iPhone like he recommended. The young Martin returned, and before Carl could tell him to shut the hell up, he yelled out loud if the monster was still there. Carl tried to re-engage his son, knowing that the child's words would wound deeply, but they had apparently penetrated efficiently because the squatting Maya had completely shut down. Carl tried again and again to entice Maya to vacate, or at least speak again, but there was simply no response, and he realized there was nothing he could do for the time being, and he would have to just let this adult man take his time saying goodbye. Carl would have to rejoin the party, at least until someone asked about his son. He told this to Maya in so many words, and then followed that by emphasizing that he should take as long as he needed and join his family when he was good and ready. Here would have been where he turned and headed back down the hallway to rejoin the festivities, doing his best to bask in these so rare but so joyous moments with his family and keep a positive attitude until his son reemerged, having had his closure, and all would end handsomely. However, before he could do any of this, Martin's mother, Yulia, and her mother, Sherry's sister, Lisa, came down the hallway, and upon seeing the homeowner talking through a locked door, they had their own set of questions ready to fire. Yulia, much like her son, was not a quiet person. She loudly asked what was going on in a screeching tone that Carl could only pray would not venture past the hallway and into the party itself. Before he could temper an answer, she added another pair of questions on top of the previous as to whether someone was in that room and if that door was locked. Carl, who did not know Yulia very well, would then find out that unlike her son, she was a very sharp woman because her next statement was a request for him to confirm that it was, in fact, her infamous cousin Maya in what must have been his old room. There really was no stopping her because Yulia then started relaying what she knew about this whole kicked out at 50 years old situation. Martin then chimed in his shock at the concept of still living with one's mommy and daddy at the ancient age of 50. Carl foolishly thought that he could just start making his path away from the door and that would lead everyone back to the tinsel, white string lights, and related green red aesthetics of the living room. But he was quickly educated on just what level of nosy and obtrusive Yulia was willing to attain. This was his wife's side of the family, so no one could really blame him for this oversight, yet the result was still the same. A mini crowd who now knew that their overgrown man-child son was locked in his room, making a damn scene. The patriarch didn't even have time to wish that this was as big as the crowd would get before Uncle Terry and his brother Sal came around, looking for Carl to ask if they could bum one of his Cuban cigars. Naturally, as they entered the scene, Yuli was more than happy to catch them up on the most private details of what was happening. Terry asked for a quick clarification into why Carl hadn't just unlocked the door with his key. Then upon finding that he had no such tool, he made a quip about how odd it was that he didn't own a key to a door in his own home. Sal didn't make anything better by agreeing with his brother, and then adding that he always told Sherry to have two sets of every key, and he would have kept going if Yuli hadn't interjected that she did in fact hear him tell this to Sherry, and then adding how her aunt always felt compelled to learn things like this the hard way. Uncle Terry was a bit more discreet as he spoke to Carl about how his brother-in-law planned to resolve this. Carl confided that he hadn't a clue, but his current tactic was to simply wait it out, which Terry found agreeable. However, Sal did not, 
and had no issue voicing his opinion that no one knew just what Maya's intentions were behind that door, and it was no business of his, that went without saying. But he was liable to hurt himself given how he had mental issues and all. This last statement had miraculously been the impetus that began the process of engagement, because as soon as Maya heard the term mental problems, his defenses flared. He yelled out vehemently that he had no mental issues whatsoever, and this had nothing to do with his desires to harm himself or whatever old man Sal was thinking. The mini crowd went silent upon hearing the prisoner of honor speak. Yes, even Yulia. For a moment, everyone was just waiting for Maya to keep speaking in a sort of manifesto-style monologue, but they were left disappointed. Carl finally jumped in and gently affirmed that he understood that his son was as fit as a fiddle in terms of his skull marbles, but all the same... The fact that he had locked himself in a room did not back that assessment very well. Maya replied immediately that he was coming out, but just not yet. Yulia then blurted an aggressive question as to what he was waiting for, and was hit with an even more aggressive expression of how he didn't know. He just didn't know. Carl used the opportunity to jut in and confirm that Maya could take his time. They would all be heading back to the party now, and he was welcome to join when he felt ready. Fifty years was a long time, and he was just now realizing that Maya certainly could not be expected to make a sterile break with this living situation under such rapid circumstances. Following this, he held up his hand to prevent his loquacious in-laws from chiming in their thoughts as Maya digested the words. After a beat, the quinquagenarian spoke again about how he was blindsided by the banishment, and it was very true that he never had time to process the change. This was all he knew, and after 50 years of being led to believe otherwise... With only the snap of his parents' fingers, he was expected to grow up in an instant. He then continued speaking about how it made no sense. He did his chores. He kept the spaces clean. He even paid the cable bill with the HBO and Stars packages too. Truly, what was the harm in him staying? As the minutes piled up, Carl grew more and more self-conscious of the crowd around him that simply refused to leave. He wanted to have this heart-to-heart -heart with his son, a talk that he was just now realizing was taking place far too late, but not with an audience. He tried to curb his words to fit the many nosy ears, speaking to the blatant fact of how his son would have had to move out sooner or later. What life would it be for him to grow old all alone in this house once his parents passed? Whether they drew the line or their own ran out, something would have forced it. A statement which drew a scoff from Yulia. Maya continued bolstering his case with how it was not the worst fate if he stood there forever. He would take care of his precious parents as they entered their life's winter and perhaps find purpose in the service. He had not found it very suitable in the dating world and his career aspects had always been rocky. This could have been his true calling, or at least something good he could have been proud of, and his parents certainly deserved no less with all they'd done for him. Carl jumped right in and told him that there was a lot in his life he could be proud of. He was a responsible man who never hurt a fly, and there was never a complaint from any of the authorities he served under. In fact, quite the opposite. Here Uncle Terry jumped in and said he remembers very well all the times his nephew would come over in the summers and help him rake all those leaves, among other chores. This even included the summer of 08 when temperatures stood stubbornly over 100 for the whole month of August. According to Uncle Terry, Maya would come and soak through his polo shirt, yet without one mention of the inconvenience. Maya responded that it was pretty hot and he was perpetually thankful to his uncle for splurging on the special edition Gatorade and the name brand popsicles after those long days. As such, the tensions began to soften, and memories of those long summers began to sprout up, with Yulia even telling her son how cousin Maya would swoop up to a dozen grocery bags at a time when tasked with helping, to which her son stood mouth agape. Martin sheepishly admitted the most he ever could hold was five, and that's with one containing nothing more than a loaf of bread. It was just as everyone was, believe it or not, getting comfortable within their own mini-party that Sherry came down the hallway, looking for Carl, who had been absent for a noticeable amount of time. She saw the crowd and how they were all smiling and laughing, and made her way across her brothers to Carl to whisper for an explanation. It makes sense, considering he probably has been listening to that voice since conception, but Maya was able to hear his mother's whisper clearly, and he called out to her post-haste. She replied, yes, she was here and Maya broke everyone's hearts all at once by claiming that he missed her very much. Sherry wasted no time in relaying that she missed him as well. Then he made his mother all but bellow out in tears when he just went for it and asked if he could come back home. She held back her emotions, and with the help of her spouse's supportive hand onto her shoulder, she calmly explained why that was impossible. 
She continued to elaborate on essentially what his father had said about him needing to move on and the implausibility of him living there under the wings of his parents until they passed, and so on. After letting those words escape her mouth, they began to hear light sobs from behind the door. Here Sal spoke up and told the man not to cry because it's always hard getting used to something new, and it only gets harder meeting new things as we get older. Sal was pushing up against 70 now, so he was definitely speaking from a wealth of experience in this matter. Plus, it wasn't like he was alone or anything. His parents were fortunately still as healthy as ever, and if he came outside, he'd see just how many Davidsons, Staunton's, Scotts, and Pattersons had his back. The group was now getting used to giving Maya his time, and even though he was taking a bit long, they only knew he was there because of his excessively powerful breaths. His family exercised patience. They knew that the tide was turning when they heard his sobs cease, and the power of his heavy breaths quell. As Maya began speaking once more about how he was going to come out, the rest of the party guests began to trickle into the hallway to the violent shushing gestures from the original mini-crowd. Maya went on about how he just wanted things to go back to the way they were. What was stopping them? Now, he didn't say this part in so many words, but the gist of it was that he was a lost cause anyway, so why not just let him hang out? Hadn't they let Aunt Ruth do just that when she had her severe lung cancer? They told her she could just keep smoking and eating donuts all day, since her time was so limited. Sherry had even personally supplied Aunt Ruth with specialty cigars those final moments. What was the difference between that and allowing burnout Maya to just keep living at home where he was safe and happy? Of course, unbeknownst to Maya, Cousin Oliver had made his way to the hallway, and since he was on the father's side of the family, Big Tom's oldest son, he had made sure to receive the nod of approval before adding his advice. Oliver started by saying that, first and foremost, Maya was nowhere near a lost cause, and in fact, he had virtually half a lifetime in front of him. He could go ahead and toss that Aunt Ruth comparison into the wastebasket because when she was in that situation, the doctors had only given his mother six months and they were dead on. Maya had the challenge and the privilege of more time, much more time. Maya hit him back with a woe is me spiel about how Cousin Oliver was in no position to talk because he was a tall, handsome, and brilliant man who had his pick of the litter in terms of women, careers, and almost anything else. He was recruited to play lacrosse at Duke University when he was only 16. Then when he got there, he met the prettiest physics major in the whole program and scooped her up without breaking a sweat. Finally, when he graduated, one of his most exclusive internships decided to convert him into a full-time employee, and it had just been promotion after promotion since then. He all but chastised his cousin for even thinking about comparing himself to Maya. As Maya continued rambling, a loud, booming voice interrupted him. It was Oliver's father, Aunt Ruth's widower, and Carl's older brother, the rarely seen Big Tom. He had bellowed from all the way down the hall for Maya to put a sock in it and listen up. No one could attest to the validity of that metaphor more than him, because he had been with Ruth for 58 years before she passed, and he'd see to it everyone keep respect for her memory, and not use her as a trust to keep this problem from solving. The facts were, according to Big Tom, that Maya was a few crescent wrenches short of a full set, and that was okay because he was a fine man with a strong work ethic and respect for everyone around him. That was all a man needed. Now, this would be just fine if he was some stupid-ass dimwit, but Maya was not. He was a Davidson, so his standards were higher. It's true. He had spent nearly all of his life underperforming, to the disappointment of his parents, Big Tom, Aunt Ruth, and nearly this entire hallway. This wasn't a disappointment where he was being judged for his shortcomings, but more in that they just saw better things in him than what he had been producing. They had been waiting half a century for something to come from this man, and now they were afraid they'd be in the ground before it happened. Because the way Big Tom saw it, it would happen. That was a fact. It would just be a damn shame if Maya came into his own in his final few years. He couldn't think of a worse fate. So yes, according to Big Tom, his parents had to act fast, and they had to be tough. Heaven knows that he'd been soft as shit for his whole life previous. Speaking straight, it was cruel of them to do that, but kicking him out was arguably the nicest thing they would ever do for their son, who they clearly loved more than anything, with the passion so warm it was heating this hallway as he spoke. The past was the past, and now is now. Big Tom told Maya to come out of there, fix his old worn-down uncle in Irish coffee, then one for himself, and join the party. It had been too long since they'd seen each other anyhow. A silence fell upon the hallway once more. 
this time without Maya's heavy breaths. Big Tom nodded once to his brother Carl and hobbled back toward his chair in the living room as everyone else had their eyes glued on that door. Carl kept Sherry close and they held their breath as they heard movement. With just the sound of Big Tom's boots pounding the wood floors and the lingering Christmas music still droning, the lock unlatched. The knob turned, everyone quickly rushed out of the hallway to clear the path, and Maya joined the party. In hindsight, hindsight, since this was about as handsome an ending as Carl could have imagined, I guess it wasn't such a stupid idea after all. That was The Birth of Jeremiah Davidson, written, produced, and performed by me, Josh Ramirez. If you liked it, make sure you like the video and subscribe for more stories coming very soon. They're also on Wattpad if you'd like to read them. Very, very soon will be coming to podcasts, so keep an eye out, maybe an ear out for that. Thank you for listening.